G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Today we're going to be covering the final must draft players list, and this is the Deep Sleepers. Let's go! Jordan open! Chicago with the lead! Bryant to Jack! Not a game, not a game, not a game. we talking about practice. LeBron James with no regard for human life! AB Basketball! G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter or X at Ball Boys Fantasy. And today we are covering the sleepers. We've got at 20, 122, Taylor Hendricks. At 126, Mike Conley. At 131, Josh Hart. 133, Marcus Smart. 146, Jeremy Sohan. 161, Dyson Daniels. Uh, Alex Saar, 165, Noah Clowney, Anthony Melson, and Blood Club Ballet. I'll see you guys later. Bye. All right. No, seriously. <laughs> We're going to go through the uh, deep sleepers in today's podcast. And that was just a little short rendition for all you guys that think that, you know, the intros take too long and I could have made this a, a two-minute video. Well, there you go. There's a two-minute video. And uh, I hope you got all the information that you need. Uh, but seriously, we are going to be talking about some deep sleepers in today's podcast, guys. And I hope for you guys that do enjoy the show, that actually do sit and listen um, as to my reasonings as to why I have these players highlighted that uh, you don't mind me waffling on a little bit. This is my show. This is how I'm going to do it. And it's how I'm going to continue to do it. But um, please, if you have any feedback, please drop me in the comment section below uh, and try to do so nicely. But uh, just a little bit of fun there. But yes, we're going to talk about some deep sleepers. This is the final podcast before NBA fantasy kicks off. I may, I'm still not 100% sure if I'm going to do the auction draft for the industry pickup league, which will be on Sunday my time, Saturday night, your time, uh, US time, uh, because it is five o'clock in the morning for me. And I don't know if my partner will appreciate me um, swearing profusely during a <laughs> mock draft at five o'clock in the morning. But let, let's get stuck into it, guys. If you haven't already checked out the previous two uh, videos in this series where I've gone through basically 10 players uh, in the draft range. The first one was early rounds, top 50. The second one was the mid rounds, 50 to 120. Uh, and this is going to be my deep sleepers. So anything outside of the top 120 on Yahoo's rankings, which have updated recently. So uh, a couple of these names have changed. Some of the players... Um, have moved around, although it's not a huge shuffle. So these players are basically your flyers, the players that have a bit of upside depending on where you draft them. So these are the guys that I like for your last um, three or four rounds of your draft. Um, some of them might even be okay drafting a little bit earlier than that. So let's get stuck into it and I'll stop waffling on. Uh, let's talk about at number one, or the first guy that comes on this list. This is not in order of my preference, but in order in which they arrive in Yahoo's rankings. Taylor Hendricks is the first guy we're going to talk about here. Uh, he is ranked at 122 on Yahoo and he could potentially be the starter, starting power forward. I think it's likely that he's going to be the starting power forward for Utah on opening night. He doesn't strike me as a super, a super high upside fantasy player yet in his career. He gives me, um, he kind of has the shape of like a Jaden McDaniels to me, maybe as a better rebounder. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but a guy who, oh geez, got some cat hair, something flying around. Uh, but anyway, a guy who gives you threes, uh, a steal and a block per game. Sold enough percentages, although I think the assists are going to be very low. I don't think he's going to be scoring a whole lot. Um, I think he will just be solid. I think he has a chance to be closer to that top 100-ish rankings if he gets the 30 to 33 minutes per game. Um, but a young player, and a young player that's going to his second year, I do think he does have some upside to just improve on what we've seen already. But his general overall fantasy shape of his stats is... Um, is Jaden McDaniel-esque, which isn't the highest of upside archetype of a player, although I do think he can be a slightly better rebound. And if and if he can just scale it all up a little bit, 
Um, I think that that is something that you could do worse than pick a Taylor Hendricks um, and just sort of bank on a little bit of upside there. At 122, he's probably not my favorite in this list, but definitely someone who um, I would be looking at towards the end of a draft. So I do like him and did include him on this list. The next guy is not a young guy. It's a very old player. And it is Mike Conley at 126. Now, he's ranked at 126 on Yahoo, but I see him go a lot later than this in a lot of other drafts, probably because he's bloody 37 years old, uh, which is which is old, right? But Mike Conley is about as consistent as they come. And starting NBA point guards are very, ve- very valuable in fantasy basketball. He is someone that's going to give you some really good assists, some good threes, um, give you over a steal per game, solid percentages. He's not going to turn the ball over a lot. And if you listen to my previous video where we talked about um, the mid-round guys that I'm targeting, at the end of the, the that video, I had some players like Amen Thompson, like a... Um, uh, who was the other uh, Like a Keontae George. If you want to reach early on some of those guys, some of the guys that you might really like and go before sort of the bench player um, range in sort of like rounds 11, 12, 13, 14. If you want to go early on a flyer type in like say round nine or 10, then a Mike Conley is a perfect player to draft around this type of the, the, the draft because you're going to get really steady production. And I think he's going to beat this range. And I think he's going to beat the ranges where he's going, which is usually 130, 135 plus. Um, so you're kind of mixing around the order in which you're taking the high upside flyer type um, a round or two earlier than some others to make sure you get that player that you really want. Um, and then you get a Mike Conley, who I think you're going to get a good value um, at 126. He's going to give you really steady production. Now, his minutes might be monitored. He might sit some back-to-backs. But I think just from a discount point of view, he's not a sexy name. He's not a sexy pick. Uh, but I, I do think he's a really good value and a really good follow-up to some of those high upside guys that you might need to take around earlier than some of these deeper sleepers. So um, for that reason, Mike Conley does make this list. And I think we should not be sleeping on him as the title of the video suggests. The next guy is uh, another older player. Not a, well, not an older player, but not a young player. It is Josh Hart from the New York Knicks at 131. He is going to have to play a bunch of minutes this season. New York is incredibly thin. Their starting five, not only do they have Tom Thibodeau as their coach, so you already know the minutes are going to be big, but Tibbs has really got no other option. Um so I expect him to play close to 35 minutes a night. He's a great rebounder, a solid assist player, good steals. The field goal percentage is nice. He'll hit a three, three and a half per game. He won't score very much. That's the, the drawback. And, and his usage has been very low in the preseason. Um, but compared to everything else that he does, I still think he's going to be a very valuable player. And at this point of the draft, you're probably not going to be finding very many high scoring players as it is. But it's very difficult to find good rebounders. A lot of the centers have gone by now. Um, So to get a high rebounding player as a shooting guard, small forward eligible uh, player in Yahoo formats, I think is extremely valuable. Instead of reaching on some players like a Valanciunas earlier or um, going really, really hard on on a, if it's a Zubats in the 60s and 70s, I would prefer to still try and get some good value and then maybe look for someone like a Josh Hart to be your kind of rebounding boost at the end of the draft and and give you some solid other stats and assists and steals Um, and just know that his minutes are going to be very, very high. If any of the other starters get injured, his usage has a chance to increase and and boost its way up. But you're not drafting him for that. You're not drafting him for usage. You're aware that he's not going to score a whole lot of points. Um, So... Keep that in mind, but at this point in the draft, I think that you, you hopefully, and, and I've preached this a lot, you've got your points sorted earlier if you're looking after that, or you're punting the category, which is one of my favorite builds to do, and Josh Hart is an amazing player to target in that type of a build. Um, at 131, he is someone that I would be very happy to take inside the 120 sort of mark. I see him as a bit of a, a nice starting sort of 10th man on, on a fantasy team, Um or similar to like a Mike Conley, if you took a swing on a, on an Amen Thompson or a um, uh, why can't I a Keontae George? I keep forgetting his name. Uh, a Keontae George earlier in, in round nine or ten, then he's a good guy to follow it up on. So you don't have um, too many players that have the risk of really flopping and having to drop too many guys at the start of the season. He will get steady production. He also plays um, the first night of the season, so. 
you get a quality game right off the bat when there's only two games on to start that opening night of the NBA season, and Josh Hart plays that game. So it's something to keep in mind that he's going to be used um, in that first opening night where not many other teams are playing. Obviously, only four teams playing. If you get a late Josh Hart, at least for that first week matchup, it's it's a good start to your season, and then you can sort of reassess after that full day the next day uh, on, on if anyone pops and things like that. So I, I think Josh Hart is a very good and attractive uh uh, option at the end of your drafts at rank 131. I'd be happy to take him uh, around or around and a half earlier than this if I needed to. The next player, again, following the, the sort of theme of older players uh, late that are getting a bit too discounted in my opinion is Marcus Smart. Yahoo has him at 133. Marcus Smart is one of the best steals guys you can get late because he is elite in that category, but he also provides other things. He's going to provide solid threes, solid assists, um, and if there was an ever, ever an injury to Ja Morant, um, who has gone down with several injuries in his career, he would get a really nice boost. But just for his um, threes, assists, and steals alone, he, I think, has a very strong chance to be closer to the top 100 than this 133 mark. And um, uh, I think him and Conley sort of are very much, they kind of go in a very similar range of the draft. So maybe if you're looking for a more steady assist production, uh, Conley might be a guy. If you're looking for more sort of concentrated in steals, uh, Marcus Smart is an option. I almost think that Smart has a higher upside than than someone like that, um, just because of the other players around him, potentially with injuries and things like that, he has further upside to go. Um, a, a way to elevate his game and elevate his role in within this team, depending on who's healthy and who's not. Um, but even still, if everyone's healthy there, he's going to give you, uh, I would assume, at least one and a half steals per game, maybe four, four and a half assists per game, close to two threes, uh, which is very difficult to come across. Um, his field goal percentage is going to be poor, but he's not going to be taking that many attempts that's going to really kill you. So I think it's something that you can withstand as long as you're not sort of teetering on that average kind of range for field goal percentage. But if you punted the category or your team is strong enough to withstand it, I think he's a very, very solid player to pick. Um, he's not going to really hurt you in many other areas. Not a huge scorer, better than, than a, someone like a, a, a Josh Hart, but he's not going to be going out giving you 20 points a night. But again, at this point of the draft, hopefully you've taken care of that scoring beforehand and you can get some of these specialist types players to be really useful in rounding out your rosters. That should comfortably be more valuable than this 133 ranking suggests. So he is someone that I do like there as well. And hopefully his health um, can withstand the early parts of the season and get some good use out of him to begin the year. The next guy here, going back a little bit younger now, we've got Jeremy Sohan of the San Antonio Spurs. He is ranked at 146 on Yahoo. Um, I think that he has a chance to be a potential breakout player this season. He is no longer required to play a you know point guard role, which he played at the beginning of last year. He has better players around him, such as a Chris Paul, Um to sort of help him develop his game, put him in the right spots. He's a young player. He's a very, I think he has a very high um, defensive number potential with steals and blocks. His comparison coming out of the draft was like that Draymond Green type. Um, And I can definitely see that from a defensive stat accumulation sort of shape. Um, The rebounds, uh, a little bit of assists, maybe three to four assists per game, a steal, a block per game. I think the percentages can improve in year three, I think it is for him now. Um, We can see that improve again with with just better floor generals out there with with the Chris Paul. I think that's going to put him in some better spots. Um, The gravity of Wemby sort of growing again in year two. I think he's in a really prime position. You've got no Devin Vassell to start the beginning of the year, so he might see a bump in usage early on. Uh, I think that at 146, you've obviously got nothing to lose and and a lot to gain, I think, from this spot here. He... um, Kind of has a bit of bit of a bad rap because of the disappointment in the point guard experiment, which kind of lingered on um, as a narrative surrounding Jeremy Sohan. But I still think he's actually a very good player. I'm pretty confident that his minutes are going to be quite high uh, for the entirety of the season. He's one of their building blocks in this team. Um, really, it's him, Vassell, and Wemby uh, in my eyes, and, and potentially... Um, their, their rookie that, that's just come in, depending on how he goes, uh, in Stefan Castle. So I, I think he's he's a strong contender to get 30-plus minutes a night fairly comfortably. And those players at this point of the draft are fewer and far to come by. 
and players going into their third season with potential that they showed as uh, rookies. I think it's I think it's a very low risk, high upside gamble to take at this point in the draft, um, and and just to have a swing. So he he definitely qualifies to me as a very good flyer to take at the end of the draft at one forty six. The next guy you've heard me talk about in the breakout uh, candidate video, Dyson Daniels is one of my favorite deep sleepers in fantasy basketball this season, ranked at 161 in a 13-team league. I think this is outside of a standard league roster. Um, So if you were just top drafting the highest ranked player, here we go undrafted in a standard 13-player, 12-team league uh, on Yahoo. So... He definitely should not go undrafted. He will not go undrafted if I'm in the league. Dyson Daniels at 161, I think, is is massive, massive upsides. I, I think he's going to start. I think he's going to start opening night at shooting guard. His steal upside alone makes him extremely valuable. He's a big dude as well. Um, uh, it looks like Anika Kongu is back. And if Kongu starts next to Dyson Daniels, I can see really good rebounding numbers for him. He's actually, he's a big guy. Um, so uh, he's a really good rebounder for his position. He can pass a little bit as well. The steals are great. He looks like he's improved his three-point shot, at least from a small sample size in the preseason. So I think the field goal percentage, which was really, really bad last year, I think that might be deterring some people. I think it can jump a fair bit this season. Uh, I think, what was he? Maybe he might have even been under 40%. I'll double check that. But I can see that going closer to sort of that 44 45% from the field, which is really not an issue at all. Um, he's someone that I think just has potential to really elevate himself in like an NBA sense. I believe in him as a player. He's a very smart player. He doesn't require the ball in his hands, so I think he fits really well next to a Trey Young, assuming that his shot can be semi-average. Um, so, okay, no, sorry. He was 44.7% from the field, which is not as bad as I thought. There was a stretch, I think, when he was the starter that he was shooting absolutely terribly on the Pelicans last year, where he, I think he went on a stretch shooting under 40%. And I think that's kind of maybe soured people's uh, view of him. Um, I don't expect that to be the case this year. I think he's going to be, yeah, close to that 45% type of a player. Averaging maybe around 10 points, five, five and a half rebounds. You could probably get maybe three to four assists from him. And, and again, like a Marcus Smart, a 1.5 to 1.8 kind of steals per game is definitely not out of the realms of possibility. If he can give you one to one and a half threes, I think that's a really, really solid player. Um, definitely potential to be a top 100 guy, top 90 guy even, in my opinion. I don't think he has further upside than that. But at 161, what have you got to lose? Um, I really don't see the downside in taking a swing at Dyson Daniels. I'm happy to take him around the pick 120 kind of a mark. Um, 120 to 130, I'd be very happy to go for him. And um, especially if you're looking for those steals, uh, a solid rebounder, solid percentage guy. Um, Maybe you are punting points like I like to do. Uh, He fits that build really, really nicely. And I just don't see a lot of holes in his game outside of the scoring. Um, I think he's just a very solid, high-contributing fantasy basketball player um, that maybe gets dinged a little bit because of that stretch that he had as a starter in the Pelicans and the fact that he's not going to be a high scorer, which is maybe a bit of the flavor of these late-round picks. The next guy here is the one and only rookie on this list. Um... It is Alex Saar. And when I did this, when I was preparing for this video uh, and podcast previously, his ranking was not this low. I think he was ranked a fair bit higher than this, but has dropped down Yahoo's rankings in their latest and likely final reshuffle of their ranks. He's now at 165. Now, I'm not a big Alex Saar fan. I don't necessarily believe in him. I watched him a few times here in Australia in person, and I wasn't super impressed with what I saw, but he's going to get all the opportunity in the world. And especially if they can play him at center, which they they experimented with in the preseason, playing him at center, Koulibaly at the four, pushing Valanciunas to the bench. If he plays center, he could smash this, these numbers. Um, he is a raw talent. So I do believe that the field goal percentage is going to be pretty rough. Um, I don't see him as a huge rebounder, but the, the block shots can be there. He can contribute threes. He, he, he'll rebound a little bit. He'll rebound solid, solidly. Um, I, I think that he's just far too talented to be undrafted, like this ranking suggests. 
I was out on him when he was kind of going, and he, he might still be going that in more competitive leagues. If he was going around 100 to 110, I wasn't interested in taking him there. But if I can get him outside the top 120, I'm very much interested. I, I think at the moment, he's only power forward eligible. I do think that that will change. Um, but could could Saar give you 1.8 blocks per game? Absolutely, I, I think he could. So he's kind of like that... Um, uh, last year, we were taking Derek Lively late in drafts as a bit of a high upside block pick. Um, I, I think he could be viewed as a very similar type of player. Um, he won't have the field goal percentage that Lively had, but he'll bring you more threes. And I think he can give you some maybe some more other stats like some uh, sprinkling of assists and things like that. But do keep in mind that his... Um, his percentages, his uh, turnovers more than likely are going to be pretty poor. Like your typical rookie shortcomings. Um, so you've got to be ready to sort of, um, you know, withstand that. But when you're picking outside of 120, you, you just want that swing of an upside. And I, I think he definitely has it. He's going to have that opportunity to start the season. I think he plays more than 30 minutes a night from the jump. Um, and yeah, I think, like I said, I was out on him going top 110. I'm in on him going outside the top 150 and at 165, if that pushes him down the board, I am all for taking that swing uh, on Alex Saar, despite me not being his biggest believer in real NBA terms. Um, let's go on to the next guy here. Noah Clowney at 166, so one spot back. Um, compared to some other analysts, I'm not as high on Noah Clowney, at least initially in the season. I think at some point during the season, we're going to see some really, really good things from Clowney. I think it might be a little bit of a patient waiting game at the start of the year, whilst Brooklyn Nets are trying to fool themselves into thinking that they're going to win some games. But I do think eventually he's going to win out. It's just kind of in daily changes leagues, if you can withstand that weight a little bit. But at 166, you've got, there's nothing to lose, right? Um, could he start, come out and start opening nights? I think it's unlikely. But could he get back up minutes at the four and the five and push himself up to sort of 25, 26 minutes a night? Yeah, I do think that could be possible. And in that situation, he could potentially be someone that is worthy of a roster spot, maybe bringing you back top 120 value. Um, but I do think that he maybe is a little bit further down the list on this list um, in terms of the the high upside, at least early in the seasons. Uh, I think his value is going to be more realized sort of all-star break, post-all-star break. Maybe a bit before then, maybe a little bit earlier. But And, and if any injuries come into this, uh, into this team, we know that they're going to not rush people back. They're not trying to win this season. So I think he's going to be a very big beneficiary of that uh, mindset for, for Brooklyn. I, I do just want to temper expectations that I'm not sure he's going to have this awesome out-the-gates production this season, but I'm still willing to take him in the last round or two of my fantasy basketball drafts, just in case I'm wrong, and just in case the talent just shines through and he wins out. He, he, is, he does have a very friendly fantasy game, you know, solid percentages. He can hit you maybe a three per game. Um, he can give you a block, nearly a steal per game. The rebounds are solid. Um, he won't give you really any assists, but and the scoring is not going to be huge, but he's just he's just well routed, no real obvious weaknesses. And as a young player on a Brooklyn Nets team that is not going anywhere, uh, I think that's a recipe for success at some point during the season. The next guy here at one seventy one is DeAnthony Melton. Um, this is just way too low for me. I know that the Golden State Warriors their rotation, especially in that guard wing spot is very, very messy. You've got Steph Curry, you've got Draymond Green. Outside of that, like it's very difficult to know what they're going to be doing. But this is exactly what a late round deep sleeper is all about. Getting a guy that on the chance it falls his way, that the upside is massive, that is exactly what DeAnthony Melton is. We know he's a very, very good per minute producer. He does not need 30 minutes a night to be a top 100 player. Um, the steals, the threes. Um, he can give you some blocks from his position. Half a block to 0.6 blocks per game is definitely something he could do. He's actually not a, a terrible rebounder for his position as well. He can give you a trickle of assists and things like that. The free throw percentage is not. He's not going to turn the ball over. Um, there's some really, really good things to like about him. It's especially the steals. It's especially the threes. Um, and, and I think he's, personally, I think he's one of the better players on this team, and I am tipping that he's going to win out 
above players like a Buddy Heald. I think he and Podzemski are probably the two guys to get the bulk of those minutes. Um, whether or not it's enough to sort of be a must-hold type of a player, yet to be seen. But that's where you just take the, you take the punt, I think. So taking him in your last pick or two, last round, last one or two rounds, I, I think is definitely something I'd be very interested in. The steals, weirdly... There's a lot of steel specialists here, but they do dry up pretty quick because a lot of the guys, if you're not picking them, don't average a lot. So we talked about Dyson Daniels and and um, Marcus Smart and De'Anthony Melton fits into that mix there as well. Uh, but he's just someone that just has a very fantasy-friendly game. The field goal percentage is going to be poor, but again, it's on low-volume attempts. And He's value if he plays 25 minutes per game. He's a smash pick if he plays 28, 29 minutes per game. And you've absolutely gotten nearly, nearly, probably not quite, but nearly 100 spots of ranking value um, as someone who could be a top 90 player in um, 28, 29 minutes per game. And again, any injuries that come along early in the season, you're going to see a massive, massive uptick in Anthony Melton's uh, production. And if not, you're still going to get some solid production, even if he's playing mid-20s in minutes rather than high-20s in minutes. I think he's just someone that epitomizes that late-round flyer upside pick. Despite him not being a young rookie second, third-year player, he just has that fantasy-friendly game about him that if things go right, you're going to be in a very nice position. And then the last guy is that sexy pick. It's that second-year player, Bilal Kulabali at 187. This is a guy that I just think there is tremendous potential for him to improve. He strikes me as that guy that is very was very raw in his game coming to his rookie season. He was exceptionally young. I think he was the youngest player in the draft last year. Um, started a lot of games last year. Started, what do you play? 15 minutes, 15 games as a starter, uh, playing 29 minutes per game. But he is still, he's only just turned 20 years old. Um, he has good defensive upside. He could give you a steal and a block per game. But I also think there's some very nice offensive potential here as well. I think he shows uh, flashes as a good playmaking player. I think um, there's been a lot of talk that he's improved his ball handling a lot in the offseason. I think he's going to get the minutes straight out of the gates, uh, 31, 32 minutes per night. Um, and just second-year players playing 32 minutes a night with the length, with the upside that he has, being the has, as young as he is. Again, I'm not leaving a draft with Bilal Kulabali sitting on the waiver wire. He has to be drafted, in my opinion, to take that upside shot. Um, you know, drafting players that could force their way into minutes, maybe if there's an injury or could they do it in 24 minutes a night. Don't worry about that if there's a guy who's guaranteed to play 31, 32 minutes a night and he has the upside, he has the potential, take a punt on a player like this and, like, again, this is a guy that could potentially... This guy could give you 120 spots of value. It's unlikely. I'm not going to sit here and say that this is a top 70 player, but I'm saying that he could. Like, there's, like, a 5% chance that he could and that's what these late-round picks are for because... Again, he's got the tools, he's got the length, he has the dexterity, he, he's developing in terms of his skills, and he has the opportunity. And that's what it's all about in his last round picks. Players with upside, players with opportunity, and I think Bilal ticks all of those boxes. He hasn't shown the super friendly fantasy game yet, but he's not a player that, because of his age, that I'm pigeonholing him into, this is him, this is him as a finished product. Uh, I think he has a lot of different avenues to expand his game on a Wizards team that um, are going to be forcing him minutes, basically. And I think playing at power forward, if they do opt to do that, can massively improve his game. Because if you're playing against Alex Saar, who's not you know, an enormous rebounder. His rebounds have potential to go up to maybe six per game. Um, his blocks have a chance to rise as well. Um, I think playing against bigger players, he can utilize his speed a little bit more. I have a lot of high hopes for Bilal Kulabali, um, at least down the road, but it could be it could be something that happens out the gate because he has that opportunity. So he is someone that I really, really like. And at 187, you will have to scroll down a fair bit if you're playing on Yahoo because, um, yeah, that is... That is a f- that's fairly deeply down the draft board there. Um, I would definitely be drafting him in all 12-team leagues, absolutely. So, 
Those are my deep sleepers, guys. Thank you very much. If you did manage to tune through that uh, that opening and <laughs> intro sequence there, my super long intros that I always seem to do. Uh, but I appreciate all the support you've given me in the preseason so far. Um, Again, look out for the auction draft if I decide to do that or not. But otherwise, I will be getting back into a one-per-week podcast this season to review each week and all the happenings and going some buy lows and sell highs, all that good, sort of good stuff. So make sure you stay tuned. Follow me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. Give this podcast uh, a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure you like this video. Subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. And I'll see you guys in the NBA season. Good luck with your fantasy basketball drafts. Bye.